The video you're about to watch has been designed to take you deeper, higher, and wider into Yahweh. Enjoy, and please subscribe. Thank you. Well, tonight I want to I wanna take everyone in this room to a higher place, a deeper place, deeper in you, so we can begin to understand and see and perceive what needs to change in us for who we are to come in full fruition. According to what you've destined, according to what you've desired, for us as your people, as your sons and your daughters, as the Ecclesia, as a company of people that operate from out of your throne, from out of Mount Zion. We have to begin to see who we are. We need to begin to see what needs to align in our lives so that we can be propelled to a higher, deeper, wider place in all of who you are, in your kingdom, in the different kingdoms, in the seats that you have placed us, in the different realms. We're beginning to see, Father who we are, and slowly but surely we're also moving towards what needs to align in our lives so that everything can fall into place. Creation has been waiting for sons and daughters such as these to stand and begin to do what needs to be done. So Father, as we come before you tonight, I ask you to open up every spirit man in this room to pour into us everything we need. But at the same breath, I'll open up every soul so that what's in our spirit man and seated in Christ can be poured into the soul so it can begin to affect the body. You promised in your word, saying, as Yeshua stood before you, he said, now glorify me as I've glorified you. And Yeshua in his resurrection become a fully glorified being. He is our image, Father. That's what we walk in, that's what we said to. We ask, Father, to begin to direct us into that walking towards becoming fully glorified beings, understanding that as a spirit being we are glorified, as a soul we walk towards glorification, as a body we need to change the DNA structure of who we are and what we are right now to the record that's in us so that we can become glorified bodies and fully a new created being which is a glorified being to start walking the face of the earth in the fullness of your glory as Moses comes down the mountain. Oxy, the lion man, flashing from his face, lightning, fire, protruding out of him, because the glory of Yahweh just completely overshadowed him. Father, there's a company of people that I believe in the time we'll be in right now will start walking the face of the earth in that image. And I pray, Father, will begin to reveal to us as we go deeper in intimacy with you, begin to know you better, and begin to love you and walk with you like you not did, how that intensity of your glory overshadows us. It is incredible and it's exciting. Father, we love you. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Whew. Okay, so just a little bit of basics on what we did last week. I don't know about you guys, but I've had an incredible couple of days, just in the spirit, just deep in the different realms. Father, just opening some new things last night's teaching was absolutely incredible. Um, I'm going to try and go back. Uh, to some of the things I've done over the last couple of weeks. Uh, shoot, a Thursday night's teaching was absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, I would urge you to go to Facebook, find it. Um, it was incredible. A lot of revelation coming directly from the throne, directly out of Zion, which is incredible, which means I need, I need to basically go back and listen to my teachings, which is quite crazy. Because it feels like that when I'm going to speaking, I'm in awe of what's coming out of my mouth because my spirit's going, oh wow, this is exactly what I'm taught in the heavens and my soul's going, I've never received this, you're only downloading it as we speak. This is not fair, I have to now go back and listen to it. Um, but it was really incredible. I even wrote, as I re-shared it, that this was incredible. So I would urge you to go back and see if you can listen to that. I can't even remember what it was named, but it was good anyway. <laughs> it's on your Facebook, right? It's on Facebook, yeah. I haven't put it on YouTube yet because I'm a little bit behind. On, on YouTube, I don't know why, but uh, there's just so many videos with every single night. It's really mm -hmm. not up, so yeah. try and edit, get it up. And of course, uh, the phone I'm using, unfortunately, is Android. I know everyone in this room uses Android except okay. me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why, but uh, iPhone does not have the program I use to edit the videos, uh, which is depressing because I've got this phone that's got like 128 gigs of memory. And I can't use it to do the videos, so it's kind of frustrating. <laughs> so I have to download the YouTube, the Facebook, Facebook videos onto my phone, my Android phone, which only uses uh, Wi-Fi. And uh, for some reason, Spectrum uh, sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to get sued. <laughs> but unfortunately, the area that I'm in, everybody uses it. And so our internet is so slow, it's a drag. And Fridays, you can't even watch any movies or do anything. 
But that's a problem because Friday nights when my family is flat and goes to the video night or movie night when I'm not there. Mm -hmm. uh, they get very frustrated. Anyway, mm -hmm. so very far off the point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my soul. Now, you have to understand something. Um, your soul was in charge of who you are most of your life. As a matter of fact, all of your life until you got born again, but because it was never taught, your soul was still in charge. So your soul probably would have been in charge until you heard the, the teaching, the mind, soul, and spirit. Now that might not sound right because, well, you know, the Word of God talks about all kinds of war between the flesh and the spirit. So it's been, it's been preached, but it's never been accessed in us. And now that Christians for many years, we have raised the dead three times, seen phenomenal miracles, um, led many to the Lord, did all the basics of my faith and had a great time and my soul and my spirit wasn't divided yet. You know, my soul has already been through a transformation where I didn't quite think like I used to, but in reality I kind of just thought the exact same way. But I was just suppressing the thoughts, not to fall back into the old ways. That's kind of what we do. So with dividing soul and spirit, the idea is that of course that my spirit man begins to overshadow. And I say overshadow, it's like the um, Holy Spirit hovering over creation and things began to fall into place. It's the same as um, the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary and she felt pregnant. But it is it's my, my spirit man overshadowing my soul to reinstate uh, the fullness of who I am as a soulish being. Now remind yourself that your soul is in the image of your spirit. Your, your spirit is in the image of Yeshua. Yeshua is where my spirit is seated in, in heavenly places. So my soul, being in the image of my spirit, has to receive the knowledge that my spirit carries. That's why we have to open up our soul gates. Now, Ian Clayton has a book on soul gates. I have studied it and enjoyed it thoroughly, but it's interesting because even before I have uh, found to listen to Ian's teachings or have his ministry a mentor me, I in my journey as a Christian, and I'm sure everybody's actually done this, I've taken myself back to the date of my birth. And then work yourself through. Uh, if it's not, uh, for me it was every year. Work myself through to see what was affecting me, what was stopping me, what was blocking me. Because the way we think is assigned to how we grew up. You know, which city, which town, what type of people was around you, what school did you go to, what TV programs did you watch, what type of parents did you have. That will mold and fold the way you think and perceive things. What church you go to? What type of religion were you bound to? Because it does bind us. Right? That's what religion does. It kills the Jesus in you. So there's a lot in us that needs to change. And we have believed that it will just automatically happen. Now let me just tell you something. In our faith, there's nothing that automatically just happens. And that sounds depressing. But unfortunately, the only... Um, quick fix is what you make yourself, Come on. right? And it, and it doesn't work. If you've ever tried a quick fix, it doesn't work. It works for the moment you're in, but as soon as the quick fix is over, you're going back to your old ways, everything's just going back. You cannot consistently act in a way that's inconsistent to you, right? So you have to get a consistency in your way of acting to change your lifestyle. That's right. And that's why your soul, and of course you have to remind yourself that your soul is the stepping stone into the spirit. Your soul will not allow you now, understand that my soul, my spirit has been divided, meaning that my soul no longer has um, uh, my spirit over it, or, or I have my spirit to submit over it. My spirit is now in charge. Um, my spirit is sitting on the throne on the inside of me in Christ, and my soul, am I saying it right? My spirit is sitting on the inside of my, my being, on the throne in Christ, and my soul is overshadowed by my spirit, and my body is overshadowed by my spirit. Uh, it has to submit, that's why we fast and pray. Now, we don't have to fast and pray forever, but there's a season and a time in your life where you fast and pray to submit your soul and your body to your spirit. Right? Because I don't fast uh, to twist God's arm. I fast to submit my spirit, my soul to my spirit. So that I change the way I perceive things. That I don't look at the circumstance. I don't look at the natural. But that was, that's what my soul wants to do. My soul looks at that chair and thinks it's metal. It can handle my weight. That's what I've perceived before. That's what I've understood. If that was one of those plastic garden chairs, my soul would have said, 
This is a slippery floor. Do not sit on that chair. Thou art going to fall us on thy buttock. But that's just something I've perceived before. My soul will not allow me to sit on a plastic chair, but I know. But my soul is that gateway into the spirit. So you have to change the way you think. And that's really the key to spirit school. That's kind of funny because the key to your fullness in spirit is your soul. Mm -hmm. Now we understand that your soul is your, your mind, your will, your personality, your, your um, way of thinking, your way of understanding, your per perception, the things that you understand in your natural. That's what your soul presents. Now we have in our natural capacity, we have thought with our brain and our soul. Right? And you have to understand, before you got born again, your spirit man only gave life, that's what we discussed last week, only gave life to your soul. Now that you're born again, your spirit is more than just something that gives life to your soul. It is the primary you. So it overshadows your soul to such an extent that it pours into it everything it knows. Your spirit is all-knowing, your spirit is all prayer. Your spirit has the capacity to be exactly like Yahweh in its fullness. That's why I can take my spirit into the kingdom of heaven and my spirit can be overshadowed by Yahweh and I'll survive it. Now it is terrible and it's scary and it's really freaky. It sounds, well, you know, he's a, a, an entity that we can't fathom. And God is a, a presence that we cannot really explain or express in the natural because he is more than what we can ever even begin to think of. But in the spirit realm, my spirit can, can be contained by God. My, my soul doesn't have that understanding yet. So it's a process of having to change it, having to place my soul into the position that my soul has been, that my spirit has been in. So the idea, of course, is that we begin to understand how desperately the Father wants your soul changed. So I'm going to go through the process of changing my soul, getting my soul, and it's through engaging um, the kingdom of heaven. Everything we do in spirit school is about engaging the heaven so that my soul can begin to see what my spirit is doing. That's why we soak before we start meeting. This part of us needs to be renewed or restored. It is the part of us, our conscience, that needs to get the mind of Christ. In Romans 12 it says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we have to change the way we think, right? Because we have this understanding, I think, with my mind. Now we're beginning to understand, let me just finish the scripture. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so you'll be, right? We need to understand that, well, how do you think in your heart? We are conditioned to believe that you think with your brain, and of course, we've only operated as a soulish being, so it's my soul, my brain. But when you get born again, the activation of your spirit opens up another dimension of how to think. But now I'm thinking with my heart and my spirit. Yeah. That's why when I divide soul and spirit, there's another aspect to it, we've done it already, it's when my thoughts and intent of the heart have been dealt with. Mm -hmm. So I change the way I think. My heart is, um, uh, as I say, your heart above all is, is wicked. But when I've divided soul and spirit and I've entered into the heavens, like the high priest, the most holy man um, on the planet, um, Joshua, the high priest, he enters into the kingdom of heaven, stands before the Father, and he is full, he's filthy. Yes. That's, that's mind-blowing. How is that even possible? But immediately, as he presents himself to the Father, filthy. Now, he's the holiest man on the planet. And he gets stripped of his clothes, new clothes, and given new turban to put on his head. And the Father presents him pure and set apart. So when you present yourself in the kingdom of heaven, immediately the Father cleans you up. That's that representation where I give myself to the living sacrifice. You do not have to clean yourself. He cleans you. So when I begin to present myself in the heavens, I change the way I think. That's called repentance. I don't repent of sin. I, re I change the way I think. From, from thinking with my soul and my brain, which is attached to my birth into sin, and the way my parents raised me, and the way uh, the church taught me, and the way my teachers taught me, and the way TV taught me, and the way my friends taught me, and the things I believe according to what I saw, to the things that I now experience in the heavens, the understanding of who my Father is, what He's pouring into me, what He's given me, what He's destined me to become, and who I need to be. 
I change the way I think, so I no longer think with that which is attached to the world, I think with that which is attached to the heavens. Yes. So that's the process, of course, we want to go to. We understand in Ephesians it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, understanding that the Father has given you a dimension of truth wrapped around you. It is a knowledge of what is right and wrong. Now I say right and wrong meaning what is life. Because we do not eat off the tree of right and not wrong. That's what religion brings in. It tells you what you can and can't do. Jesus does not bring that into fruition. He doesn't tell you what you can and can't do. According to him, all things are pure. Why? Because of a pure heart. That does not mean we can fornicate, pornography, all the stuff that we think we can now do because to the pure, all things are pure. No, see, in the kingdom of heaven, there's no trace or record of sin. So everything you want to do out of the kingdom of heaven is pure and holy and set apart. But when we start living in that kingdom, we begin to understand what we represent in the earth. Things open up. We understand that we are righteous. And that we are presented in the right position for the Father to pour into us everything that we need for the time or the season that we're in at any given time. He says to take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Again, the Father says He wants you to begin to meditate and focus on that which gives you life. That which gives you a weapon in your hand to destroy the works of the enemy. Not to fight the enemy. Not to come against him physically, but to have access to cut off what's coming against you that gives access to the enemy to bring notification in your life. That's where we use the mobile courts, right? The Father wants you to begin to see in the way you think and perceive what needs to be erected in your life, what needs to be aligned, what needs to be put into place. In Psalm 23, we've done that Psalm already, but he says, He restores my soul. So the Father's desire is to restore your soul, your world, mind, and emotion. How do you run your life? How do you think of things? How do you react to things? His desire is to have you run that emotional state that you're in from the kingdom of heaven. Understanding that we live by faith, not by the way we feel, think, or understand things. If we had to only do what we understand, we will hardly do anything. <laughs> Our soul gates. Um, our conscience, reason, imagination, mind, emotions, choice, and will. I'm going to go through these, and uh, so it'll be a, I'll, I'll try and be as quick as possible, but I want you to kind of have an idea and then remind you that the spirit school is not just something I'm teaching. You know, I, had, I have had uh, um, been mentored by, by these men online and engaging in their teachings for seven years, and my responsibility to, before I even begin to teach any of these things, was to engage into every single teaching, to trade into every single teaching, to engage in it and to make it my own, so that I can begin to find what they were talking about. I need to change, I need to engage, I need to go in as deep as possible, I need to take these gates and open them up for myself. It is, it is key, your conscience. Our conscience is the ear of our heart, the ears of your spirit, of your soul. It is our predictor and our director, our God and our, our um, guide. Our conscience will keep us from wrong and direct us to good. Sadly, our conscience will also be dulled and seared by repeated exposure to sin. And we understand that Satan has done this because he takes your... And if you continue to do something knowing that what you're doing is wrong, he takes your desired stuff away. Yeah. It dulls and sears your conscience. Your conscience, they say, and it's not per se, but it's that soft, gentle voice that tells you that what you're doing right now is not pleasing to the Father. Mm -hmm. And it's the Father's desire for us, well, obviously, to have a clear conscience so that He can pour into us what's needed for the time and season we end. We need our conscience cleansed, clear, and sharp. His desire in your conscience is for you to understand that you are consciously aware of Him, mm -hmm. that your conscience is constantly focusing on the kingdom of heaven. What is in there? What is in there for you? When you engage, what am I engaging into? Is am I engaging into a fantasy or am I engaging into an imagination? Something that my spirit is revealing to me. Am I just going off on a, on a rampant, a rampant um, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> rampant. Rampant, rampant trail, rampant. Uh, you know, what we do is because of uh, rampant fantasy, 
something that you have seen, something that you've heard, and you just want to direct yourself towards that because that's something you want to engage. Instead of waiting on the Spirit, having what you see be revealed to you by Yahweh so you enter into that gate, not to create your own gate because you can do that. And you can take others into that gate if you've created something. But the idea is obviously to be in Christ and to have Him open that gate and go into that direction that He wants you to go into. And of course, when my conscience is clear, when I've been seared in the measure of the way that I think, no longer with my soul and my spirit, or my, my soul and my brain, but with my spirit and my heart, and things open the right direction. Okay. That's why the word has to come in to bring the vision. My reason. And it's not that we reason and try to work uh, it out with our intellect. That's what the church age has been doing. Everything had to be worked out with what you know, what you understand, what you perceive. It had to be through your knowledge and through what you've studied. But we're beginning to understand the Father doesn't work like that. He gives infused knowledge. Yeah. He pours into you a whole different way of perceiving things, a whole different way of reasoning. Because He shows you a better, higher, wider, deeper way to engage into something. That's where wisdom, knowledge and understanding comes in. It is about being able to translate and interpret the words of God that are spoken to us. To understand and explain God's word as he speaks it to us. So you have to understand something. Uh, in the kingdom of heaven, God doesn't speak like I'm speaking to you now. This is a lower form of communication. But in the kingdom of heaven, when he speaks, it is a knowledge that your spirit already carries that needs to be translated into your soul. And if your soul is not open for this, that's why we have to read the Bible. Uh, it's something you have to physically do. That's why we have to physically praise. We have to physically worship. You want to engage your being in what you're doing in the heavens. That's why we can't just soak all the time. That's why we can't just come to a spirit school. Because this is for your spirit. The idea is to, of course, engage in multiple other things so that you can open up your whole being for what the Father wants to do in you. But in spirit school, I want to teach your spirit man to engage in the heavens. But you have to remind yourself, I have to, to activate my soul, I have to use my, my will, mind, and emotion. To activate my body, I have to use my hands and my mouth and my ears to activate who I am in the position that the Father wants me to go into. Because your soul and your spirit and your body are equally important. And there's no separation in the importance of who you are. Yes, I'm primary spirit, but that doesn't make my spirit more important than my soul and my body. Yeah. We have made our body less than our soul and our body and our spirits, so therefore our body is dying. When you start elevating your body back to its position, it will change its DNA structure. That's when we engage into the heavens and begin to eat of him and drink of him as he's desired for us to do. Okay, your imagination. Now, I'm going to make it very clear. Imagination is not the same as fantasy. Fantasy is something you physically make up. So, 90% of us uh, in our entire lives have used fantasy above imagination. Right? Imagination, and I've said this several times with what I'm teaching from the beginning, but imagination is inward sight. It's what is already inside of you, revealed to you by your spirit. And your eyes on the inside of your soul will look at the picture that has been framed by, by your spirit into your soul and it will begin to run a program as it looks at these pictures. Yes. A fantasy is something you desire via either a perverse nature or of your soul and your mind and you will make things up as you go along according to the feeling you need for the moment you're in. Your imagination is different. Your imagination sees what your spirit reflects on the inside of you. So everything you see in the kingdom of heaven is shown on the inside of your spirit, your soul. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. We understand that uh, the imagination is the eyes of our soul. The Bible talks about the, under, the enlightenment of your understanding. Yes. Your understanding is attached to your soul. So it's the enlightenment of your soul. The opening up of what your soul needs to see. And we understand that the soul has been blinded because it's so attached to the body. The body looks at something uh, in the natural and that's all it can perceive. So the soul being attached to the body in this measure, whatever the body looks at, the soul perceives and that's what it is. That's a chair, you can't tell me any different. There's not another chair on that that I can't see because my soul can't perceive that and my body can't perceive that. There's not another round where we are right now because I can't see it. Um, and in the natural, you would think, well, there's no other God because I can't see and touch and feel this God. That's how atheists perceive it, right? Now, I'm not saying that we are all atheists before we got born again, but that's how the soul, without the spirit, you cannot perceive anything supernatural. 
So the Father wants to activate the eyes of the soul, which is the imagination. And it's the absolute, absolutely the key that we need to develop. In Western culture, our education system have trained us out of using or valuing our imagination. Our imagination was given to us by God so that we could see what He is doing. That is incredible. It takes something. Um, my imagination, I used to have a pretty vivid, and I say imagination, but I know that it was more fantasy than imagination. But it was, it was part of my life for many, many years. Fantasizing things that I would like, things that I want. And it became very real. And now that I've changed the way that I think, to engaging with my soul and my spirit and my heart, the imagination, the inward sight, has opened up excessively. And in the physical things that I feel I'm doing in the spirit, it's overwhelmingly real. Yes. And the Father designed that for the ecclesia to such an extent that it is His heartbeat right now. He wants us to see, He desires for us to see. So that we could see visions. The engagement of your imagination is so that you can see visions. Dream dreams and see the heavenly realms and the screen of our imagination being activated. Yes. There's much to be seen, there's much to be understood in what we see. See, the Father wants us to begin to realize that the natural, <coughs> that which you can see in the natural, which my eyes can perceive, is not even a measure of what's out there. You know, Ian Clayton talks about 280 something different species that he's already engaged in the human power. Now, in my understanding, what I've engaged at this point is the angelic, and of course there's different species of angels, and I've seen many, many, many different, I don't know if he's including the different species of angels, I don't know, because he's got different names for different uh, canopies of angelics, which I don't understand or see that as yet. But I've seen the angelic, I've seen the seven spirits engaged with the 24 elders and the four living creatures, and I've seen a different type of angels in the seraphim and cerebrum, uh, fiery serpents, and then the, 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 those who look like the four living creatures. I've engaged with the 22 letters, which is absolutely mind blowing. We've engaged with the saints of old and the men in white linen, but there's so much more. You know, we have an infinite God that's constantly creating, and He doesn't stop because we don't understand. He continues, and He wants us to see and perceive and understand all these things. That's why he's desired for us to divide souls and spirits, step out of this kingdom, into the kingdom of heaven, and live from out of there. That's why he said that he, we are to be aliens. Yes. Now, we don't understand aliens. That means you have to give up your citizenship as American, give up your citizenship as European or South African, and begin to live out of the kingdom of heaven. No aliens there. No. <laughs> I don't want to give up my citizenship. I did it. <laughs> yeah, right. We need to learn how to grow and use it again and train it so that it grows and develops into what it's supposed to be. See, if I have eyes in the natural, I have eyes in the spiritual, and I also have to have my eyes and my soul developed. So in essence, you have to have six eyes. Ooh, that could start a whole new religion. <laughs> Six, six. Okay, we are the people are ridiculous, right? But the Father's desire for us to begin to see. That's that's key. I mean, if I have to go back to everything I've taught over the last seven years, I've realized how the heart of the Father for his sons and daughters is to see. And if I look at Yeshua talking to Nicodemus, and he, all he's really saying is, once you get born again, born from above, you can see the kingdom. And it's not just about seeing the kingdom, it's about operating. You know, uh, for you to not be able to see, you have to enhance all your other symptoms. Now, I I'm not blind. I have been uh, for, my, I was blind for, for five days, or a little bit less than five days. I was in a car accident and the window shattered, the windscreen shattered into my eyes. And so they had put salt or cream into my eyes and then they shut my eyes for two days, three days. And it was really weird. I mean, I didn't know whether it was daytime or nighttime. It was just, everything was about my ears and what, what I hear and what I feel. And it was just really strange, you know? Yeah. And what, if you don't understand what you're not seeing, it is very deceptive. Yeah. Everything sounds wrong. It sounds crazy. And when you eventually see what you thought it was, it's always the opposite. It's like, what? <laughs> okay. It's, you know, it's like, it was weird. It was really, really weird. And the church has not been able to see. Now I think because we can all of a sudden see, we're realizing that the things we used to believe, because we couldn't see it, is now 
changing because of what we perceive it to be what is right. But now that we can see what we thought it was and realize, okay, it's not that. If you've never seen grass and you only thought what it could look like and you in one day your eyes open and you see it, you'd probably be wrong. <laughs> Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Let's look at the mind. Our mind is our conscious and our subconscious. It is where the storage programs are. This is where you find all your memories. Now you have to understand your memories, as good as what they are, can bind you. That's part of the gates that needs to open up. Because we've done, we've done three gates already. No, we've done two, two, two gates. No, three gates. Conscious, reason, and imagination. Looking at the mind. This is where you find memories, the Word of God, our belief systems. It is like the hard drive of a computer. Everything is stored there. That's why going back into your timeline, and we haven't done timeline yet, but we've touched base on it. So you begin to understand that according to the mobile port and the system that it runs, the legality of the system in the heavens, I can go back in my timeline because I'm in Christ. He's the light, meaning I'm operating at the speed of light, living in the light. Where I am, in Him, there's no time and space. You being able to go back into your past and deal with things that's taken you out of alignment. Right. So that when you get back to your today, reminding yourself that today is living one day into my tomorrow instead of my today as, if I, know, as I know it, because I have the capacity to see my tomorrow and bring it into my today. So that I can deal with the things so that the gate can open. Exciting, right? Yes. Our subconscious is our mind, our heart. It sits somewhere between our spirit and our conscious mind. This is where our memories, beliefs, values, lies, truths, and mindsets are. Jesus called it uh, the soil, and it can have all kinds of seeds sown into it. Now, I don't know where you're at in your life right now, well, I can kind of see, but the idea is that we need to unroot the things that's preventing us from moving forward. Mm -hmm. And it's not something I can do for you, it's something you have to look at for yourself and dig into it as deep and as quick as you can. Mm -hmm. And again, there's no, there's no takeaway for this. You can't go up to a window and say, okay, this is this, this is what I need, please give it to me. Something you physically have to go sit and do by yourself. And not even something husband and wife can do together. Or maybe there's a process you can take in small portions of where you're at right now that you can do together. But this is for the individual. But yeah. you have to go into your own life and see what needs to change to get you on track where you need to be. Yeah. So the gates can open the Father can begin to flush into you what needs to come in from your spirit. Our subconscious mind is affected by our DNA nature. From our parents that sets up defense mechanisms and, uh, and uh, coping mechanisms. Our, our, our patterns of behavior came from what we believe. Now, I don't know what you believe, but if I look at my culture, my culture, now I was never too much of a cultural person. Um, all my friends were into rugby, I didn't too much care for rugby. Uh, because of the, the culture of our nation, there was much racism, violence, aggression, um, alcohol abuse, drug abuse. It's just the, the culture, and it's probably pretty much the same here. You know, yeah, it's football and basketball and South Africa, and South Africa it's cricket and rugby. And people make it a god in the nature, and it's all about what happens while you're watching rugby, while you play cricket. It's all the drinking and taking drugs and sleeping around. And, and then, of course, after the game is finished, you go to the pubs and the nightclubs, and that's the kind of life, you know. Get married, get divorced, get married and divorced, sleep around, doing all kinds of stupid things. That's kind of what the understanding and perception is as we grow up. And that's the DNA structure and the nature of the DNA. Now it's not for everybody, and I know that everybody doesn't live that life, but that's the DNA that needs to change in us. And of course, it might have changed over the years already, but it's still a subconscious understanding and revelation we, in, in a major run to. So I might have a mentality of uh, what I used to have, but now it's no longer derived to a, derived to a physical um, temptation where I want to sleep around and do stupid things and go get drunk and party, but I will use that mentality in my spirit walk. Now we don't always understand that, but that's, it has to be dealt with, otherwise you're just going to swap it for something else. For example, if you have an addictive personality, you have to deal with addiction. Now we are created to worship, so addiction is a, is a, is a form of worship. You have to direct your addiction to the right path. That's the idea. You want to direct your nature to the right path. 
God wants to open that up. Our parents, uh, our patterns, our behavior come from what we believe. Nature has an effect too. We have had a whole lot of experiences of life during our upbringing and education which train us to operate in certain ways. Now, when I look at my life and I, I realize the things I used to do when I was in the world, and sometimes I would react in the exact same way towards my kids, towards my wife, towards friends, family, situations, I'm in, things happening, and I had to sit back and say, well, this is actually not the way I'm supposed to react. And I thought my wife, my helper, she is very, very good at this, and she would look at what I do and she says, that's not the way to react. And I would look at her and she would react in a way, and I think to myself, that's not the way you should have reacted, you know? And we are open enough to talk about this and discuss this with each other, because yeah. we want to have somebody in your life that can align you. But in the same breath, you have to be aware of where you're at in your walk with Yahweh because you are consciously aware of what needs to change in you. Mm -hmm. You know, I say to my wife, um, and this is something the Lord has given me as a responsibility in my house as a high priest, everything that happens in my house, no matter whose fault it is, it's my fault. <laughs> no matter how it happened, no matter what happened, it's my fault. I have to bring alignment, I have to ask for forgiveness, I have to align things because I am the one that has to change. Now, everyone can have that mentality. My wife can have that same mentality. My sons and daughters can have the same mentality. Whatever happens in the house, it's your fault. But in the same breath, because I am the, the covering, as I have to say, I'm the, the priest in the house. I intercede. I step in. I take responsibility for everything. And of course, that's a mindset that needs to change for, for all of us. We need to begin to understand that every part of your life, you have to take responsibility for. Even that which is in your bloodline and that which is in your DNA. When you start taking responsibility, it opens up the gate. We understand that trauma can, can shut the gate. Um, the things that happen to us and cause us to make vows, decisions based on our experiences. You know, um, just a simple example, um, I remember when I was a little kid, I would, I would, I would fall in love all the time. I don't know if you've ever done that. And I remember every time I fall in love and it doesn't work out, it's like I make a vow that I will never do that again. Or I would, I would get into a fight and I, I would feel, you know, I didn't act right. I would do it differently. I would make a vow. I would get sick. I would get angry and I would make a vow. Something would happen in my life and I would subconsciously make a vow to do it differently or something changes. Now, that causes um, basically a doorway open for familiar spirits to come right. in, to direct the way you think, to direct the way you believe, a specific perception, understanding of certain ways in your walk. All these things gets us connected to this familiar spirit that's assigned to our lives. Now, a familiar spirit can be connected to you through a bloodline because we understand that once, if, if you had a familiar spirit in a generation, and like my parents had familiar spirits, they pass away. Now, they, those familiar spirits can't come to me and my family line, but they can be carried over to my sister and to her family line because they're not born again. Well, they're not in the full process where we are. And so uh, when a demon or a demonic entity, a familiar spirit, no longer has a house to stay, it moves on to the next generation according to the blood mark. Yes. Okay, so we need to get to that place in our walk where we literally take these things. Now, they say that every, every Christian at average has between five and seven familiar spirits. Now, that doesn't mean that you're demon possessed. It just means that there's familiar spirit hovering around you directing your way of thinking, your patterns, your thinking, your understanding, your revelations, and tells you what your behavior should be, tells you what your emotions should direct you to, and it basically controls who you are. Now, it doesn't always control, because you can have, so that you have authority over it, but we don't always have authority over it according to what we decide. Yes. But the idea of this is that we begin to understand that I cut that thing, and I begin to nail it to the cross and beat the living snot out of it. Yes, yes. <laughs> They know us, these familiar spirits, and they, they lie to us in order to get us to operate from a false belief system. All those things on the inside of us manifest on the outside in the ways, in the way we think. So things like our reactions, our attitudes, our responses, fear, worries, uh, all come from the inside and manifest in our mind. Of course, that's the place in your life that needs to be aligned.
Yes. It's that which is on the inside, that which the Father wants to take and put back into the way it was meant to be. And that is why we engage in the heavens. We engage in the heavens so that my spirit can begin to pour into my soul all that I need. Yes. Because things need to fall into place. And of course, if the Father is coming to this understanding where well, well, my soul can go into the kingdom of heaven with my spirit, then we need to begin to engage in that. You know, Ian Clayton has a really good teaching on the night watch. I have engaged with it several, several times. I have been um, finding myself on the night watch more frequently than ever before, so I am beginning to understand it. I have taught on it a little bit, and I probably will teach on it again at a later stage. I just uh, kind of still want more information on it, and um, still want to engage it more. Because I have experienced it several times, but not in the measure that he talks of it. But I really believe that the idea of the night watch is that I take my soul into the kingdom of heaven with my spirit. And the vivid extremity of what I see overshadows my soul and begins to change the way I perceive things. And it literally rips out the things in my soul that shouldn't be there to bring the alignment that's needed. That's why it's something I constantly want to do. And what I've done at this more point in my life, I have begun to see my soul in the kingdom of heaven with my spirit. Um, now I am spirit with a soul that has a body. And when I go to the kingdom of heaven several times in an engagement, I'll take my body in with me. Now my body stays behind, so it doesn't really go in. But by faith, I will picture my body and my soul and my spirit in the kingdom of heaven, getting overshadowed by Yahweh and His presence. And I think, I believe that this is a way to trigger your whole body going in eventually. I believe that, and of course, the idea between uh, about everything we do is to have intimacy and engage the Father as we get to know Him and love on Him. It's all about relationship, all about understanding Him, loving Him, pushing deeper into a relationship with Him, right? Yeah. Our behavior patterns start to come from the revelation of the truth of the Word of God, especially about who we are. See, His desire is to have you begin to believe what your Spirit tells you about who you are. Now, your Spirit tells you about who you are in that already knowledge you have inside of you. That's what the Spirit does. As a matter of fact, like sometimes when I teach and I'm speaking a revelation I didn't have in my soul, I realize that it's a revelation I've always had in my Spirit. And my Spirit wants my soul to get to the place where it can perceive what it's pouring in. That's why I have to engage. That's why the studying of the Word is the bout. You have to study the Word. And that's, I'm talking about the written Word. Know the Bible, study the Bible, uh, get into it so you can have a background of who the Father is. It's, it's only a love story. It's only a small portion of who He is. You can't judge God according to His Word. It's not possible because it's just a very small portion. He's an infinite God, uh, bigger than we can even begin to fathom who is yet you want to judge him according to his word and place him into that little box of 2,000 pages. He's more than that. But this is the beginning, but that's the belt. That's what holds everything together. You've got that which is spoken, which we can now go into because we're beginning to understand as spirit beings, we get to go into the unseen. We get to understand that because of spirit beings, we get to go into Yeshua and we get to know him at different levels. We get to engage the word at a higher level, a higher dimension of truth. And of course, that's how we go in, and He begins to overshadow us, He begins to change us, and fold and mold us into the image that we engage in. We have that opportunity of surrendering to Him, and He can deal with our familiar spirits who lie to us. Our behavioral pattern starts to come from, starts to come from the revelation of the truth of God's Word, especially about who we are. I always say this. The, 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 the main focus for right now, uh, for the ecclesia, is to understand who you are in Christ. And I've said this over the last couple of weeks, the ecclesia is the, the company of people that has an understanding that we are in Him and He's in us. The church is a company of people that have an understanding that He's in us. And that's it. But we are beginning to understand that we are in Him and He's in us. And because we're in Him, we're seated in heavenly places. Yes. So that opens up another dimension, another realm, another kingdom that we can see from and live from and legislate into this kingdom. Our emotions. Our soul has emotions. Where our responses and our feelings are, we are moved. Where we are moved, where we get those gut feelings. How many of you understand? Now, I don't know how uh, our men operate like with this. I don't particularly run my life about my feelings. Only because I've been a Christian for a very long time. I remember the days 
When you don't feel the mood for something, you just don't do it. You know, I've been in the gym for several years, many, many, and then that fact I've been in the gym for 20, 28 years. And I can't tell you the amount of times that I did not feel like I wanted to go. I didn't feel like I wanted to go, but I went anyway. <laughs> because I cannot be driven by what I feel. Uh, and your know, faith is the same. I'm not emotionally driven, I'm driven by faith. I'm not emotionally driven, I am driven by my desire to, to step into who Yahweh is. Emotions uh, affect our esteem, our worth, whatever we feel, whether we feel love, security, acceptance, or value. And you cannot value yourself according to what you feel. You know, I've seen many times how people wake up in a specific mood and that feeling directs their day. I mean, you understand that. I mean, you have to choose before your day even starts what it's going to be like. Yes. It is the way you perceive your feeling and direct your feeling that elevates you to the next level. Right. Uh, emotion cannot bind you because you are not emotions. You are more than your emotions. Yes. Right? We, have, we all have unmet needs. Maybe as a child in our relationships, uh, we didn't receive all that we should have received in the way that we love, or in the way of love, security, acceptance, encouragement, or so on. And the Father wants to have you deal with those things. Because if I, if I say Holy Spirit in this room, everybody has a perception of Holy Spirit. You know, he's a teacher, the guy that comes and he's a soft, gentle, beautiful Father Yahweh, but only wants to encourage and uplift. If I say Jesus, we think that he was such a loving, kind, gentle man who came and died for our sins on the cross to bring restoration and restore us back to the Father. Incredible. But if I say Father, then you immediately think of your own Father. Because that's a natural concept. It's something that you can engage and understand. And that's not good for everybody. You know, there's an emotion that's attached to who your Father is. What type of Father that you have. Now, maybe in this room we've had good experiences with Father. My Father was a great Father in my perception, but he was an alcoholic. He didn't always supply my needs. He didn't spend time with me. He wasn't there for me. Like, I wanted him to be there for me. But I had a Father that was always there. He was never in pubs. He was never out drinking. He was always at home. So it's not like I had an absent Father, but I didn't have a Father that did the things I wanted him to do. So is that a good father or a bad father? No, but I have a father who's always there. So my perception about God is that he's always there, but he doesn't always supply my needs. He doesn't always do what I want him to do because of my perception. So I have to change the way I perceive the father's heart. Because although my father was always there, that's not the way the father is meant to be. A father is there for his son, for his daughter. He wants to spend time with them. He wants to engage with them. He wants to open up for them. He wants to bless them and heal them and bring them to the place they need to be. But that's the Father's desire. There's a process of changing the emotions that has led me to believe certain things. How many of you understand that? Again, this process, we end up with a low self-esteem or disappointments in our life. Those, these can result in our, in our feeling insecure, rejected, being dependent on other people, or in codependent relationships. This is where we make mistakes. We choose the wrong things because we are driven by a feeling, something that has shaped us to perceive things in a specific way. And that's where we get all the stuff that we find ourselves in. Now, of course, as Christians, we, 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 we are... The Father's desire for us as born-again believers are to move out of that way, that understand that perception, that way of thinking. And of course, it doesn't happen immediately. Because we are not taught immediately when we get born again, because we're not disciples. When you get born again, you're told to go into the world and preach the gospel. <laughs> Share your testimony with everybody. And we don't get the mothering that we need as, as born-again babies, as, as someone that just comes into the kingdom. But if we have gone through the process in the right manner, then we would become mature much quicker. But we have a, a church full of people that's been in ministry, that's been walking with Yahweh, that's in leadership, that has not dealt with their soul and their way, of, their way of progressing things and their feelings and perceptions. Of course, the Father wants to open that up, right? Our behavior doesn't just happen. Our behavior drives from the things which are on the inside of us and God wants us to operate in forgiveness and to be restored, changed and renewed so that we can, uh, so that the strongholds 
and all the hurt and pain uh, in there can get dealt with. You know, it's his desire for us to be healed. It's his desire for you to be whole. So that when he begins to pour into you the things that's coming uh, from the kingdom of heaven that you have not studied, you have not seen, you have not been taught, you believe it and run with it. You know, because any of these things in my in my gate, my soul gate, is going to shut down and prevent me from going into the kingdom of heaven. Your will. You are, you are reminded that you have a will. <laughs> that no one's forcing you to do anything outside of what you choose. I think I understand that. Now you might say, well, I didn't have a, well, I didn't have a choice. Well, you always have a choice. Now maybe sometimes if something is forced upon you, you do not have a choice in what's happening to you, but you have a choice in how you react to what's happening to you. Now that, that could be misunderstood in so many ways. If I think of uh, many people that get raped and abused and all the stuff happens to them. But in the same breath, it is the way that you handle what happened to you. Now, we have a, a, a system in the kingdom of heaven where the Father wants to deal with what happened to you in a manner that brings healing to you. Right? So you don't always have a will to choose what happens to you, but you have the will to choose how you deal with what happened to you. If we sin through stubbornness or rebellion, our will is damaged and affected, and then effectively becomes a barrier to what God wants to do. Why? Because you begin to perceive things in a certain manner. You know, when, when I when I first started, now this is just a thing, this is just a very basic thing. If you open a door, that door stays open. You know, I mean I remember, and this is this is kind of a private thing I used to do when I was a little kid, I used to pray, and um, as a young man, I did not want to die a virgin. <laughs> How big I don't know why. I used to pray this. And I was very specific on who I wanted, what she would look like, and when it needs to happen. I was very young. <laughs> and I don't know who answered my prayer. I know for a fact it wasn't Jesus. <laughs> but I started having sex at a young age. Not too young, but pretty young. I mean, young. It was young. And that was a door that opened up, and it just never stopped. Yeah. You know, I had to willfully decide this has to stop. Because once the door is opened, you will, according to what you have already designed in you, run after it. And especially if it's certain saying it knows how it can stop and block you from going in to what the Father has for you. It will cause damage and stop the will of the Father in your life. That has such, such a thing as unbelief, indecision, control, doubt, and fear. It is when we begin to understand that your will has to be directed by the Father. Because if you operate in your own will, it will be directed by the enemy. And the enemy is, uh, has a way of forcing himself onto you to do things against what you will to do. But because there's pressure, you will to do it. Yeah. Let me understand what I mean. As we start dealing with them, God wants to replace them with humility, confidence, boldness, courage, persistence, determination, perseverance, self-control, which we understand is the fruit of the Spirit. He is desirous to change this unbelief, indecision, uh, control, doubt and fear into a positive dimension where he opens you up and he begins to push you. But again, the Father doesn't push like we perceive pushing. His submission is gentle and kind. He leads you into the position you need to go in according to what you've decided in your heart. So he places his desires in you so you will to do what he wants you to do. Because he doesn't want you to do things because you're forced to do it. It has to come out of something you will to do for yourself. Once we start doing things like that, everything changes. That's why I cannot force anybody, and this is what the church has done. We have told them that you are all sinners, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. So in the natural, you want to rebel against it. The Father doesn't work like that. He never tells you what you have to do. That's why the Ten Commandments, it's not Ten Commandments like we perceive it. It's in a matter of fact that marriage to two that opens up another dimension of how the Father longs for intimacy with us. Will you be in the place that I want you to be? Will you operate in the way that I want you to operate? Can I direct you into this position? Will you go there if I open all the doors for you? Will you love me in the manner that I want you to love me with all your heart, my body, soul, and strength without me having to push you, without me having to make promises and you're only doing what you feel is a good idea because if you do it, you'll get this. You got to understand, that's not love. If you have sex with me, I will love you. That never works. Right? But that's the trick that men play on women. Because that's what they want. So if you, if you give me uh, love, I'll give you sex. Well, you give me sex and I'll give you love. But it never works like that. You know, we understand that women sleeping around, they, they fall in love with everybody. 
man that sleeps around does never fall in love. It's a difficult position. That's why there's a desire for us to stay in the marriage covenant. And it works like that in every aspect. He puts a desire in your heart and he wants you to run with it willfully. Because anything that you do outside of your will, if there's pressure applied, you're not doing it because you want to, you're doing it because you feel that it will benefit you if you do it in this way, and you'll benefit if you do it in this way, so your motive is never what it should be. Come on. The Father God wants to bring that in alignment, that's why your will has to fall in alignment with what the Father is destined for you. That's good. And that's something that needs to open up inside of us. Let's look at choice. This is your final gate. That of course you need to open. In the end, it all comes down to one question. Once we have cleared out everything which could lead us away from surrendering to God and allow us to align our spirits to rule, we um, still have to make a decision, a daily choice. What will uh, what you, what will you choose to do? It's always your choice. Every morning when you wake up. The, the idea in the beginning for me was, am I going to choose to wake up and give myself over as a living sacrifice? Am I going to choose to wake up and divide soul and spirit? Now, I, I told you guys it took me nine months to divide soul and spirit, but I, I willfully chose to wake up every morning, sit down, spend time with the Father, listen to this message over and over again to change my belief system because I could not perceive it. I had to willfully choose to change the way I perceive things. Because I was never taught this. In 13 years of theology, I was never taught to divide soul and spirit. And it's something that I had to willfully choose and aggressively go after to open that gate for me. Let's press in and get to the place where all these gates are following with the life of God and transformation. So when we look at who your soul is, you have to understand the conditioning of your soul is perverse, destructive, and death. That's what you were birthed into. We were birthed into missing the mark. So that's all we understand. We understand only but to miss the mark because I'm born into sin. You're not born with sin, you're born into sin. So to get that off of you, you have to have your spirit rebirthed out of the heavens, have your soul constantly engaging with the words of Yahweh, have your spirit constantly overshadow you, and have your soul in intensely engaging over the things that your body understands and perceives so that your, your fullness can get to where the kingdom of heaven needs to overshadow who you are, if that makes any sense. How are you guys doing? We have to invite God to come into those gates and transform us. If we could be, it would be really dangerous if, if the glory of God started manifesting through us, uh, through an ungodly life, dangerous both for us and the people around us. This is just logic. You know, the Father wants to use the ecclesia to a higher dimension and out of a higher realm, realm in this time and season, and we have to be prepared to run with all that He has. No, it doesn't mean that, well, well I, my gates are not open, my gates are not ready, I can't do this yet. See, every time you present yourself to Yahweh in the kingdom of heaven, there's gates that open. There's a mindset that changes, a perception that, that realigns. Every time you go up, every time you go in, there's a difference. Yes. Every time. Don't, don't feel, well, I'm not feeling anything. See, it's not about feeling. There's a gate that, that, that you should open up. The Father wants us to begin to understand that His desire is to propel you to a higher place and the soul gates are opening up and every time you present yourself to him it opens it aligns it changes we will not allow his presence to be manifest out of us until there is a holy life for it to flow through we understand that that's just logic you know but in the same breath it's not that legalistic because of his mercy and his grace you know, when I present myself to the Father, I present to myself to Him by faith. I stand before Him. His blood has cleansed me. Yeshua's blood has cleansed me. I, by faith, stand before Him, pure, holy, set apart. When I'm on this side of the veil, I look at my actions and the way I feel direct my steps. That's why His desire for me is to understand it's not about what you feel. It's not about your own will. It's about engaging in me, knowing that I am... Um, you know, I am the head, you are the body. And everything that you are is because of what the, the direction of the head goes into. Right. Psalm 103 reads like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forgive, um, forget not all his benefits. 
who forgives all our iniquities, who leads all our dis diseases, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who uh, crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfy your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. In Ephesians it says um, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and, the, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians it says, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So we begin to understand and we with us, the Father has opened up dimensions and realms for us to align who we are so we can have everything the spirit man walks in. Which means, as my spirit man walks in Christ, so can my soul. As my soul and my spirit man walks in Christ, <clears throat> so can my body. I open it up, and things begin to change. But it's homework you have to do. Yeah. <coughs> Let's stand. How are you guys doing? Great. Okay, so the Father wants us to have a glorified soul. Yeah. Now we understand the glorified soul is where the river had all the um, those scrolls, revelation, wisdom, knowledge, books. That's where my, my soul needs to gain the knowledge. My soul needs to gain from what my spirit pours into it. That's why the gates have to be open. So Father, right now, in the name of Yeshua, everyone in this room, I pray, Father, will open up their gates. Now I know that it's a process and it's something we work on individually when we go into the closet, when we spend intimate time with you. But I ask, Father, that you will direct everyone in this room to an open dimension. And we will have ourselves set, sit down and go into the first year, go into the second year, go into the fourth, the third year, and the fourth year, and the fifth year, to deal with everything according to what is given to us so that we can open up every gate in our, in our, in our soul so that what needs to take place for us to become the glorified being that you're destined for us to be, the fullness of the revelation, knowledge, and insight that my soul needs to have to gain full capacity into the kingdom of heaven and the overshadowing of my spirit man into my body and into my soul so that I can become what's written on my scroll and live out the fullness of what you're destined for me to be. I pray, Father, that you will open up our hearts and let us run with everything. Let us run with the change that's needed. Let's run with the understanding that we need to have with every part of who we are to open up according to what you've promised for us, Father. So, in the name of Yeshua, I pray, Father, that we will begin to open up our conscience, open up our reason, open up imagination, open up the mind, open up the emo emotions, Father. Open up the will and begin to understand that we have a choice and it needs to be opened up, Father. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for all that you do and ask that you will literally pour into us everything that's available for your people right now. Right here in the name of Yeshua. Amen.